So I've titled this one, Hey You Guys! <laughs> it's the X-Ray Production and Interaction Company, which you're as old, if you're as old as me, that's like this old TV show that I used to love, The Electric Company. So, yes. <laughs> Nerd alert. Oh, and I'm also, people are subscribing to these YouTube videos. So quick surprise, subscribing and the bell notification. And I can monetize the heck out of all this. All right, so here's what we're learning about today. Atoms, where are they now? Um, ionizing radiation, particle, wave, who decides? Is it you, me, politicians? Um, what exactly is going on inside that x-ray tube that's so magical and makes us feel so funny? And what's happening inside the patient? <laughs> These are important questions, right? Um, and then who is linear attenuation and why is she important? Those are my learning objectives for us today. First off, let's make sure we're good with the atoms part, right? So anytime we have a stable atom, it's going to be considered electrically neutral, right? Um, and these are the smallest particles that maintain um, some characteristic of things found in our universe, right? So there are things smaller than atoms, of course, like subatomic particles, but they do not have characteristics that are distinct to things, like they're not elements, for example, right? So um, within the atom, we have a nucleus, which is uh, typically composed of protons and neutrons, protons being positively charged and neutrons just being neutral. It's incorrect to say they're neutrally charged, right? They're just neutral. And they are really the weird one. They're the weirdest one that we're going to think about um, in the course of our work here at the college. And then outside of the nucleus, there's this electron cloud, um, which is where we do a lot of our work as CT technologists. We're working with the electron cloud. If we're MRI, we're working primarily with the nucleus. But for CT purposes, we're working with this electron cloud. And so um, it's helpful to know that if the more, um, as the atoms grow in size, one of the ways that they maintain stability um, is by maintaining an outer shell that has what's called an octet, eight electrons in it. So um, atoms that have an octet in that, ex ex that outside electron shell are more stable electrons, or more stable atoms, I should say. Okay. Um, and then finally, the last piece to understand that we need to understand about um, atoms is this atomic number or Z number of an atom. It's equal to the number of protons in the nucleus. And it really de it determines what the element of that atom represents, right? So if it has one proton, it's, it's uh, hydrogen. If it has two protons, it's helium. Now that's going to... Of, of these things, th these are all significant as we move forward, all these are going to be important, that when they're stable, they're neutral. Um, the significance of these electron clouds and what happens if we start knocking things out of the electron cloud. And then finally, <coughs> the fact that these protons, they're pretty much the largest particle that's in the atom, and they are going to have, they're going to do a lot of work towards attenuating the X-ray beam. Right, they're going to be significant towards how the x-ray beam, how likely it is that the x-ray beam will be attenuated. And then, of course, there's all these little subatomic sub things, and I'm not as interested in them. I don't really care about, I mean, they're interesting, but quarks, gluons, that kind of stuff, I don't, I know that they're there, but, you know, the Higgs boson particle, what have you, we're not going to be play, playing around with that so much. So the only reason we really care about chemistry or um, any of this stuff with uh, atoms is because of this process called ionization. This is the primary process that we're going to be exploiting to use to create CT images. This is going to be how we diagnose things, is, is through the process of ionization. Um, if ionization is occurring, there's a potential for diagnosis to occur. Um, so what is ionization? Well, we know that it's going to, number one, make the atom not stable, right? So the atom was initially 
pre preferably electronically neutral, right? If it has an equal number of protons and electrons, it's neutral in terms of its charge. When ionization occurs, we're going to knock an electron out of the orbital cloud. And so now the atom will have a net charge that's positive, and the electron will have a net charge that's negative. So we call that an ion pair, the production of an ion pair, um, meaning that we have two ions now, things that have charges to them, one of them being this net positively charged atom, and the other thing being a net negatively charged electron. Right? Um, so you might be wondering, well, who cares? Right? None of that seems to matter to you know, the price of potatoes or whatever. But um, it is significant if it happens inside of people's bodies. <coughs> right? So if the atom in question is a carbon atom that is composing a portion of the patient's cells, then we've just created a situation where alterations can happen within an organic system. Right? Things like mutation can occur, cancer can occur, right? Um, genetic disorders can occur as a result of this ionization process. So that's why we need to know the physics as clinicians, right? Yes? You said it unstabilizes the atom, right? Correct. Yeah, it makes the atom to where it's, it now has a net positive charge, and it doesn't like that. It doesn't like that. Um, it can do some other things to make it additionally unstable, like, for example, produce free radicals. Um, but I'm not as concerned for that in this class. You can file that away and we'll, we'll, get, we'll get that back out and talk about it in radiation biology, what free radicals are and how ionization contributes to that. But for the purposes of this class, we need to know what we're doing is not good for the patient, so it has a risk to it, and the risk is significant. Anytime we run someone through a CT scanner, we are producing a real risk of carcinogenesis, producing cancer, right? We are producing a real risk, if it's a female patient, of, or, or a male patient for that matter, of some kind of reproductive anomaly, right? A mutation in the, in the offspring in the next generation or some kind of congenital defect, like a, a mental impairment, right? Those are real risks, right? Um, but as scary as all that is, it is far outweighed by the benefits that come from using this technology for imaging. So it significantly outweighs it. Um, so an example of the kind of conversations we have about people, because people are scared by ionization, they're scared by radiation, so as a CT tech, the word is out, everyone knows that you are pretty much the number one cause of you know, irradiation to patients in the hospital. Um, the kind of conversations that we have has to weigh the benefits and the risks. The risk is, yes, 60 years from now you could develop cancer, right? The benefit is we can find out today whether or not you're having a stroke. So the benefits far outweigh the risks. But that risk is all tied back to ionization. So um, what causes ionization, right? Well, there is particulate radiation, right? Alpha particles, beta particles, stuff that nuclear medicine likes to play with and brachytherapy and, and radiation therapy likes to play with. We don't play with that stuff. So all that you've known about particulate radiation, all that you've learned about it, for the purposes of this class, you can pretty much forget it, right? Um, we are gonna be talking solely about stuff that happens with electromagnetic radiation, which is this umbrella term again, that has x-rays underneath it. Right? It also has pretty much anything that has a waveform to it. The one exception being mechanical radiation, like what is used in ultrasound. So it always kind of makes me laugh a little bit when ultrasound techs say we don't use radiation. It's like, you must not know what you're doing because you do use radiation. It's mechanical radiation, not electromagnetic radiation. Right, so what does this term radiation mean? That it, it just refers to anything that can move through space and do work. It moves through space and does work. So really, radiation isn't necessarily a scary term, right? I know that it has some negative, taboo stuff in the news, like if you see here, radiation exposure, right? Everyone gets scared. But really, all we're talking about in the, in the physics term and, and as technologists is the ability to move through space and do work, which has a tremendous power in it, right? 
if we can use that to guide patient care. So what are we going to use to produce the radiation? We're going to use something that's very, very controlled. And this, again, is something to tell your patients, right? When they see that radiation sign, when they see the propeller on the door and you're wheeling them into the CT scan room, they get freaked out. You can just assume they're already scared. They saw the propeller sign, and then last night they watched Godzilla, and now they're, they have the worst possible scenario going on in the back of their mind, right? Or they make some ridiculous joke like, well, now I'm going to glow in the dark, right? And it's like, I haven't heard that 500 times, right? <laughs> um, so what you can do to alleviate their concerns is let them know, because they're going to walk into this room, with, and it's going to be like, you're in this crappy hallway that smells like formaldehyde and people dying, right? And you're on, this, you're on the stretcher and you're being wheeled into the CT department, right? And the fluorescent lights are flickering and there's, there's this weird guy who looks like me who's like wheeling you along, you know, like limping after the stretcher, like dragging his leg. And they're already freaked out, right? And now you're gonna wheel them into the future where the, the space aliens have landed this giant plastic donut inside this little tiny room and it's got radiation signs everywhere, and they're all thinking about how they should have gone with all their Facebook friends to Area 51 and figured out what was really going on, right? Because now it's happening to them for real. Um, so they, all this stuff's flying at them. The first thing that you can tell them is just like, the machine is not currently making radiation. It works like a light switch. You turn it on, it makes x-rays, you turn it off, it's not doing nothing. So even though the machine's kind of got some cooling fans going on, you can just tell them it's got a bunch of cooling stuff in there, and it's, it's keeping itself cool, but it is not on right now. That's one of the first things you can do to win the patient into your corner and win their trust. Because a big part of what we do as, extra, as CT techs especially is very quickly win people's trust, quicker than a used car salesman. We need to win someone's trust, right? Um, so that they will kind of walk into the fire with us and not freak out. Because if they freak out, it gets scary really fast, right? If you can just kind of wade into the fire with them, chances are they will not freak out as often. And we'll talk more about that. Here's Augustus Gloomp freaking out inside the tube. All right, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory is in town right now, by the way, just a little bit. The Orpheum. The brand new cast, brand new score. I'm excited. My son scored me tickets, but my wife's going without me. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the tube, right? This is my really, really basic drawing in an x-ray tube. For pretty much all this stuff, we need to know what it is and what it's doing, right? Um, so uh, I'm just going to kind of go uh, clockwise starting at the stator. Um, the stator is there to help the anode rotate. The stator is there to help the anode rotate. It's called the stator because it just stays there. It does not move, right? It does not move. Um, but it uses um, pulsed magnetic fields to cause the anode to rotate. So the anode's got that, the, bear, the bearings inside of it that are also helping it rotate. And there's the tungsten anode. The job of the tungsten anode is one of the most important jobs in the x-ray tube, right? Its job is to produce x-rays. So we're going to accelerate electrons toward it. The electrons are going to be stopped by the heavy metal tungsten anode. And as a result, it's going to produce a crap load of heat and x-rays. That's what the x-ray tube does. It's basically a giant toaster oven that also produces ionizing radiation. All of this needs to happen inside of a vacuum. So we've got this envelope or envelope on the far right there. That is like normally glass or Pyrex or Corningware or some kind of heavy metal glass. No, I shouldn't say heavy metal. It is some kind of very, very strong, tensile strong glass that can withstand a whole lot of heat and maintain a vacuum. The purpose of the vacuum, like he mentions in the reading packet, is just so that we're not the electrons aren't bumping into other stuff. They're not knocking into other things and uh, it's not in any way uh, hampering the reaction that we want to occur, which is the production of x-rays. The envelope is also the reason that we need the stator. Yeah? I, I was going to say, like, in the reading, he also states that the, the main reason is to control 
control the acceleration of the electron. That's the main purpose. Of Good. It. Yeah. That's one hundred percent right. Yeah. Because if we had other things floating around inside there, we wouldn't be able to accelerate the electrons towards the anode. They'd be bumping into those other things. So that's that. I like the way that you put that. That's perfect. So yeah, the purpose of the envelope you said is say it again one more time. To control the acceleration of the electrons. Control acceleration. So we have a controlled environment where where we're accelerating these electrons. In terms of the, the engineering of this device, the envelope is also the reason why we need the stator. Um, so the stator, again, I said it's going to use electromagnetic pulses. It's going to use magnetic pulses to turn the anode. That means it's able to turn the anode without touching the anode. So it's outside of the vacuum, it's pulsing through the envelope and causing the anode to turn. That's an example of a engine or a motor, right, a uh, magnetic motor. So um, coming back around, you can see now there's some big symbols on the outside of this x-ray tube. One part is labeled positive, the other part is labeled negative. The part labeled negative is the filament circuit and is responsible for providing electrons. So now we've finally gotten to the ammunition that we're going to use. We've kind of given ourselves a lay of the land, the environment, this vacuum, um, this Thing that's spinning, it's going to produce heat. That's kind of the environment that we've created. Now we're going to talk about the major players in this thing, right? The first major player is the electron. Um, so, like we've mentioned, electrons are this subatomic particle. We're going to liberate them from other atoms through a process called thermionic emission. It means we're going to heat up tungsten atoms. We've got this filament, it's made out of thoriated tungsten. We're going to heat up that thoriated tungsten and it's going to boil off electrons. So the process of heat is going to boil off electrons. That's called thermionic emission. So that filament is boiling off electrons, producing an electron cloud on that negatively charged side. And the moment that we positively charge the anode, all of those electrons are going to leap towards that positively charged at, uh, anode. And they're going to leap really quickly. The speeds will, within a space of a few centimeters, or even millimeters in some cases, they will approach the speed of light. So it's a charged particle that's moving very, very fast. Right? Um, a similar condition is occurring inside of a linear accelerator in nuclear medicine. We're going to accelerate electrons close to the speed of light, but guess what? We're not. We're going to pull the anode away, and we're just going to bombard the patient with those electrons, right? So similar process, um, but since the patient can't be positively charged, we're going to have to use a lot of heavy-duty technology like klystrons and stuff to accelerate those electrons. In this case, we're just using the positive charge of the anode to be the pulling force that pulls those electrons toward the anode. So the anode can be considered the positively charged part of the x-ray tube. The electrons accelerate towards the, um, so we have electrons, we have acceleration, and then finally we have stopping. This anode's made out of a heavy metal called tungsten that can withstand a whole lot of heat units, right? Occasionally we make the anode out of things like gold, like for example in mammography we use different anode materials, right? But within the world of CT, we always use um, tungsten for our anodes. They, have, they may have a molybdenum or um, neck or a molly neck, and that's just to keep it a little bit lighter weight, because spinning this thing requires a lot of um, power. That is the lay of the land for the x-ray tube, the significant parts of the x-ray tube. And I think most all of those are touched on in the reading packet. So we're still inside the x-ray tube, but now we've just zoomed in to the surface of the anode. We've zoomed in to the tungsten surface of the anode, and now we're walking around on that surface where these gigantic electrons are flying towards us at close to the speed of light. What are these electrons doing? Right? 
Well, they're interacting in different ways with the tungsten atoms. So we have here an illustration of a tungsten atom. We can see that this is a very heavy metal. It's got a gigantic nucleus. Like, look at all those neutrons and protons inside of that thing. So that's tungsten. It's, it's massive, right? It, and because it has such a large nucleus and it's a stable atom, it has these huge electron clouds around it, right? Um, so you can imagine it being something like the solar system where you have this gigantic sun in the middle and then all these little tiny planets orbiting around it, right? And what we're seeing flying towards us are these little <coughs> tiny charged particles, these electrons. They're flying very fast, right? And they're buzzing past this giant nucleus, right? This nucleus is massive in comparison to them, like, like over a thousand times the size of these electrons. The electrons are buzzing past this nucleus, and as they get close to the nucleus, they are slingshotting off in different directions, right? I don't know if you've ever watched um, science fiction movies, but it's almost like they're using the power of the nucleus or the power of the sun and the solar system to slingshot off in other directions, like, like Halley's Comet or something, right? And in the process of slingshotting off in different directions, these electrons are releasing energy. And that energy that's being released is being released in the form of an x-ray. Now, I might use the term photon and x-ray interchangeably. Right? Photon is just kind of a general term that refers to electromagnetic radiation. Right? Um, but an x-ray has a very specific origin. It originates in the electron cloud of these atoms. This is all theoretical, but it, or we say it originates in the electron cloud. So that's how it differs from a gamma ray. A gamma ray originates from the nucleus. We have a nuclear reaction. A portion of the nucleus gives off some of its energy as a gamma ray. Versus x-rays originate in this electron cloud. Um, and in this case, we call these Bremsstrahlung x-rays because we just want to sound that much more like death metal about it, right? Um, and German just sounds really death metal. I've heard, and we still don't really know who coined the term Bremsstrahlung, but I heard recently it may have been Nikola Tesla that coined this term. Um, but it means stopping. It's the German word for stopping. Right? Um, and what we're referring to is the slowing down of that electron. It's been slowed down by the slingshot action with the, with the nucleus. In the process of slowing down, it released heat, and it released an x-ray. It had to give off that energy some way. What we know um, from Einstein is that, and also from, from Newton, is that energy can be neither created nor destroyed, but it can change forms, right? The theory of relativity says it can change forms, and so that's exactly where we're edging towards with this, is, is something that's edging towards theory of relativity stuff. So it's some pretty wild stuff, right? This is kind of the first magical thing. Now, what one, the other, last piece of this illustration that's helpful for us is we see that it's made two different kinds of x-rays. One, I'm going to call our white trash x-ray, our, our garbage x-ray, that we don't like, right? No offense to anyone who's white trash like the rest of my family. Um, <laughs> but the other is a high energy x-ray, right? Um, which is good, which we do like, right? So um, we need to think about that real quick. You can see the more it's slung shot, if that's a word, around the nucleus, the more higher the energy of the x-ray it released, right? So what we're showing now is that Bremsstrahlung exists on a spectrum of energy. It's a continuous spectrum of energy. So if I was to, to graph this, I've got a number of electrons over here. I have the energy that was set, which we refer to as a, a kilovolt peak. Right? So let's say our, we have a 100 kVp kilovolt peak. The number is going to look something like that. The predominance, the majority of these x-rays that are being produced through Bremsstrahlung on this continuous spectrum, you can see, um, so this direction, they're not very useful. These are the trash x-rays. This direction, they're useful. The majority of them are about a third of what we set, about a third of the set energy. So Bremsstrahlung represents a continuous spectrum of energies. This other one does not. So it's always helpful to do it this versus that and compare and contrast 
what we're talking about. So we're still inside the x-ray tube. We're still sitting there at the surface of the anode and we're watching these electrons fly at us at roughly the speed of light. But now they're doing something weird. They just ionize the atom, right? They ionize the atom and a particle just ionized a tungsten atom. And specifically we can see in this case, it ionized it in the K shell. Because I don't know who was there at the meeting of naming the electron clouds, but it was someone, I don't know if they named all their kids K or something or what, but they were like, let's start on K, right? As opposed to starting on A or B or something like that. They started on K, so the electron clouds are named K, L, M, N, O, et cetera, right? The way I remember that is kind of low mass negativities. It's just describing what that electron cloud is, kind of low mass negativities. It's important, we'll revisit it. But it matters what shell got ionized by that electron. Because it's going to produce an x-ray that's, that's characteristic of that electron's binding energy. So now what we've got is a discrete spectrum where, where Bremstrom gave us this continuous spectrum of energies what I'm saying is characteristic is going to give us these discrete spikes at really specific points that tie back to electron binding energy. And sometimes we refer to this area out here as the K edge. Why? Because it is the edge at which these K shell interactions start occurring as characteristic interactions. And I probably should just, let me, let me get rid of that one. I'm just going to leave the one out there. The rest of the K edge, or the rest of these uh, characteristic radiation interactions are happening out here in the garbage x-ray land, right? So this dividing line is like garbage, like West Virginia, Virginia. Right? Okay. No offense to anyone from West Virginia and like the rest of my family. <laughs> Just kidding. All right, so that is characteristic x-ray production. Another thing that happens is in the tube. Now, just for the sake of being confusing, right, um, unfortunately, characteristic can also happen inside of the patient. So Bremstrong only happens inside the x-ray tube. Characteristic, there can be conditions where characteristic happens inside the patient. The number one one that comes to mind to me as, an, as a CT tech is if I inject contrast into the patient or ask the patient to drink barium. I have just put heavy molecules inside of the patient. That's what characteristic needs. It needs heavy molecules. The rest of their body does not have heavy molecules. Most of their body is water, right? Little tiny molecules. Not that heavy. They don't have these massive electron clouds. But the second I inject contrast into them, like I want to do, um, I produce the potential for characteristic x-ray production. So we'll come back to that. That is really just kind of me nerding out slightly. It'll, it will matter though next trimester a little bit more because it can infect, it, it can affect patient dose. It can enhance patient dose or increase it. But here is kind of a chart of the characteristic of tungsten. Now why is it called characteristic? Because if I made the anode out of something else, guess what? That discrete curve, that discrete spectrum just changed. If I made the anode out of gold, which is what they do again in MAMO, I have changed its characteristic x-ray production spectrum. It's going to be a characteristic now of gold, right? If I made the anode out of, I don't know, pick your random weird thing, lithium, it would be characteristic of lithium, right? So what we are interested though in terms of this discrete spectrum, and when I say discrete, I don't mean like keeping it on the DL. I mean discrete because it's got just these instances where power is released. It's specific instances of power being released. Um, we have these characteristic energies. So we have the binding energy of, of 69 at the, at the K shell of tungsten, and here's the different energies that can be released. If the electron drops down from the L shell, 57 keV. 
If it drops down from the N shell, 66, KEV. If it drops down from the N, the O. So we can see a trend here. The further out that electron was in the electron cloud and it drops in, the more energy is released in the form of an X-ray. It's got to give something up. What motivates these electrons to drop in there? Well, the closer they are, the more tightly they are being hugged by this atom, and everyone likes to be hugged, right? So their motivation is they want to be held more closely. They want to be closer to mommy, right? So they jump closer to the nucleus and release energy, right? Um, what we can see, though, too, is if we say we ionize something at the L or M or N shell, we're automatically in garbage X-ray land, right? Not useful. The only one that's useful is the K shell. That's why we call it the K edge. The only one that's useful is the K shell. <coughs> so any, any energy that's produced by any electron dropping from the outer shells are just going to be craft energy based? Yeah, it's the garbage x-rays. So, like, for example, say we ionize something at the end shell, it has a, a binding energy, and it's got a bunch of electrons, but it has a binding energy of only one. Look at the x-ray power, mm -hmm. 0.5, that's garbage. Like, that, that, would just, that would just interact with the patient's skin and give them skin cancer. It's not going to ever give diagnostic information. Great question. Other question? So, the closer the shell, the higher the energy, or the farther? So the closer that the ionized electron came from, if it came from, the ionized electron came from the K-shell, it was more tightly held. Okay. Those ones on the outside are more loosely held. So they don't have to give up as much energy to drop down and gain more energy. Right? So they're, what they're giving off is closer to that 69. And then eventually we just start we just start rounding like from the end shell on. If it's dropping down into that K shell, we're just going to say it released a 69 keV X-ray. They always thought that energy was like proportional to to its kinetic energy. So I thought regardless of where the electrons are in the shell to move from one point to another, you know it. That energy is always going to be equal for each of the. That's a great question. I mean, in terms of speed, yes, but what we're talking about is the nuclear strong force, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so they're being held by this nuclear strong force, similar to gravity in some ways. So the force is like a is like a, this kind of thing that happens when when a, and when a satellite falls into the planet. Um, so it has to release that energy in the form of heat. This, in this case, it's, it's falling closer to the planet or closer to the sun, releasing that energy in the form of an X-ray. So but you'll never have a situation where like, an electron from the O shell will drop all the way down to the K shell. You certainly can. can. They do. Yeah, they do. I thought it was like a domino effect. It can be. It can be that as well. Um, so characteristic can get, we can get into the weeds with it real quick. So there is, y'all may have talked about like Ause effect, right, in physics. Um, I'm not as interested in that, right? I want to try to keep things as simple as possible. But yeah, you are correct. We can have this cascading effect of electrons filling valence shells and things like that. The one that is significant to us that can happen in the X-ray tube and affect diagnosis is, is simply this, the production of characteristic X-rays at the level of the case shell. But he's right. We just opened up this whole big can of worms of like all these different characteristic interactions that can occur, and you're right. And we can use it. We're gonna use the case shell, we're gonna use this K-edge to our benefit. So that's why we're talking about it. I wanna make sure that we're using this appropriately. Great questions. Here again is that energy spectrum just illustrated, and it's greatly simplified, right? We, like I indicated, we should have little K, uh, uh, characteristic spikes here and kind of more the garbage x-ray side, right? But the one that we're interested in is just this one that's close to 69 kiloelectron volts, right? KEV. So you'll notice in this energy spectrum, the technologist has set a KVP 
of let's say 95. This is the kilovolt peak energy. But are all the x-rays 95? Heck no. Most of them are down here in garbage x-ray land, right? So the technologist has got to figure out how do I still get the picture I want, right? Um, out of this giant toaster oven that's making x-rays. But each one of these represent, these numbers here represent an x-ray energy in kilo electron volt. Okay, so we're moving out of the x-ray tube now. We're, we're moving into the patient and all the weird stuff that can happen inside of our patients as a result of these weird x-ray tube interactions. The first one that we're concerned with we'll call coherent scatter. Now, for the most part, this is going to happen with low energy x-rays, and you'll notice no ionization occurred, right? Um, so this is just an example of kind of really how x-rays wind down their energy inside the patient. They can go through a series of coherent scattering events until eventually they go wherever x-rays go when they die, that great x-ray hunting ground in the sky. Um, but it is not really within the diagnostic range of energy. So this is, again is low energy x-rays, example of the kind of things that like the garbage x-rays might interact and do. So no ionization is occurring, it's just exciting the, the, the nucleus of the atom and then exiting in a different direction um, with slightly reduced energy. Compton scatter we are really worried about. This is, this is kind of the bad guy in here. Um, so what this has done is it's produced a Compton electron, a recoil electron, um, so it has ionized an atom inside of the patient's body, and it has now exited and has produced a secondary electron with a, with a different direction, some angle of deflection, and reduced energy. But Compton scatter bad. The reason we say it's Compton scatter bad is because it ionized something, and the only thing it can contribute to our picture is noise. All it can pr contribute is noise. The final thing that we're very interested in happening inside of the patient is this photoelectric effect, right? So the atom is ionized, typically at a valence shell close to the nucleus. So the photon has to have sufficient energy to ionize something close to the nucleus, and it's completely attenuated, right? So all of its energy is given up in the process of creating an ion pair, and oftentimes we refer to that electron that goes flying off to wherever it goes uh, as a photoelectron, right? So that is the photoelectric effect. The reason it is important to us is that it completely stops the x-rays. So things that cause the photoelectric effect will show up very clearly on our image, right? They'll show up very clearly on our image. So wherever Di wherever photoelectric effect can occur, we're going to call that the diagnostic range of energies. So it's directly tied to the diagnostic range of energies. Yes? Are these electrons that are being ejected from the atom, are they ionizing other atoms around them as well? Potentially, yeah. Like yeah. So he's right. We have two situations that can result from this for the patient in terms of biology. The first is that um, they could be ionizing other atoms around them and contributing to harm, organic tissue damage, or they could be forming um, free radicals and producing other types of elements, like hydrogen peroxide, inside the patient's body and damaging organic tissue. So even though we say photoelectric good, Compton effect bad, both of them result, from the patient's point of view, they don't like either one of them, right? Because both of them result in ionization which can lead towards, like we talked about, cancer and mutations and things like that. But for the purposes of getting a picture, we are very interested in this process. In fact, it is the exact same process that occurs inside of night vision goggles. So this is what won Albert Einstein the Nobel Prize. This is a significant discovery um, in physics. 
because it contributes to what we call differential absorption, right? Which basically means that different things attenuate different differently inside the body. Different things attenuate differently inside the body. So inside the patient's body, there will be comp and scatter that will be produced. Um, there will be photoelectric absorption. And whatever makes it through to the image receptor basically forms these ratios, and it's within those ratios that we produce a picture. So this illustration is showing the x-ray tube X-rays are flying towards the patient. We're seeing them basically in axial view from the head of the, basically the direction that we're looking through the CT, CT gantry towards the head of the patient. If this illustration was really correct, the majority of these scattered X-rays would be scattered back towards the X-ray tube. We call that back scatter. So pretty much the least safe place to stand in an, um, an X-ray room is uh, basically behind the x-ray tube, right? So what I'm saying is it does not work like firing a gun, right? If I'm firing a gun, you want to stand behind me, right? If I'm firing an x-ray tube, you want to stand in front of me, right? Um, but to the side, because the majority of what's coming off, the more, majority of what's coming for you is scattered, it's coming back off of the patient. So the, in terms of your own occupational hazard, the patient is your number one occupational hazard. Scatter coming off of the patient is the number one way that you're going to be exposed to ionizing radiation. So the, the x-rays are exiting the x-ray tube uh, incident on the patient. Some of them are being scattered in different directions. Some of them, you notice, are heading towards this image receptor. So if they hit the image receptor, they're noise. They're just making like fuzziness on the picture. The ones that are photoelectric absorbed, they show up as white on the image. Anything that passes through the patient completely will show up as black on the image receptor. Now one thing I want to point out for, for, from a nuclear med point of view, right, is very often in nuclear medicine, since the patient is the source of radiation, in essence the patient is kind of the x-ray tube as it were, we try to get our receptor as close as possible to the patient. We bring that tube down, that gamma camera down, right to the patient's the surface of their body, right? In my limit understanding of nuclear medicine. Um, that is not the case for us as x-ray tech. In x-ray technology, we want this image receptor as close as possible to the patient's body. That's what's picking up the picture for us, is this image receptor that may be kind of hidden by the patient. Um, in the world of CT, the way this ties into CT, it's going to get pretty interesting pretty quick. We'll have the exact same setup here in terms of x-ray tube and image receptor, but we're going to be spinning them both around simultaneously. Right? So we're starting with the basics. We're kind of learning how to walk before we run here. But this is the basic setup for CT. The only thing that's going to change is it's going to move dynamically the whole time that we're taking the picture. But still, photoelectric and Compton effect will be happening inside the patient, and that's what we're trying to pick up on and see these, this differential absorption pattern that can guide diagnosis. So what affects differential absorption? And one of the things we're driving towards is a discussion of kind of what we call linear attenuation coefficient. Right? It's a really fancy, nerdy word for what got through the patient and what didn't and why. Right? What got through the patient and what didn't and why. The main thing that we're interested in, again, is that diagnostic range of energies. Right? The energy range where photoelectric effect occurs. So again, we are interested in what contributes to photoelectric effect. We're interested in the comparison and contrast between photoelectric absorption and Compton scatter. Right? So that's what this slide gives us. The higher the atomic Z number, right? going back to our very first slide, the higher that atomic number, the more likely photoelectric effect is to occur. So photoelectric effect is tied to a high Z number. 
Why do we care? Well, things like bones, right, have a higher Z number. Right? They have things like calcium in them that have a higher Z number. And so bones are going to be more likely to attenuate stuff. So bones will show up more clearly, more white, on our CT pictures. Compton scatter doesn't give a rip about Z number. It just happens willy-nilly, however it wants to. It does not care. So it has zero diagnostic value, and it cannot be tied back to Z number. That's a major player in linear attenuation coefficients. Is we can now say things that have a higher Z number have a higher weight on our picture. We're getting a picture now that illustrates how things attenuate things differently, right? Like I said, things like bone are gonna attenuate more, stuff like soft tissue, fat, muscle, those will attenuate things fairly differently. As we increase the KVP, photoelectric absorption decreases in relationship to Compton effect very sharply. So Compton effect is just kind of there all the time. It's just kind of this constant noise, this constant problem. But what happens is as we increase the KVP, the photoelectric effect falls down. And now proportionally, Compton effect dominates. Proportionally, Compton effect now dominates. So this is why, again, we've got that diagnostic range of energy. If we go too high, we've just got Compton scattered, no photoelectric effect. So generally, we have what we call a fixed KVP for CT scanning. It's like 100 KVP or 125 KVP, period. So that's good news for the x-ray techs in the room. You don't have to mess around with what the KVP is. It doesn't matter in CT. It doesn't matter. We're just going to keep it fairly fixed on almost everything that we do. So that's good news for us, too, that aren't that comfortable with KVP and we're not really sure what I'm talking about right now. What I've just said, though, is We've got just 100 kVp period, and the reason is we don't want to go higher than that is because higher than that, we don't have photoelectric effect. That's the critical piece, the critical thing to see. But the practical piece, the everyday x-ray tech piece or CT tech piece is just you have a fixed kVp. Because going higher than that, photoelectric effect falls off in proportion to scatter. The final thing is increased mass density. Right? We live in what do they call it, like the bacon belt? I don't know what they call it. Um, we've got a, a lot of very large patients, right? And what I'm talking about is the distinction between high atomic number and someone who is tipping the scales more, right? So the, the greater the girth of the patient's body that the x-rays, the x-rays have to transverse, the more likely both photoelectric and Compton will occur. Right? The more likely both these interactions will occur. So as patient size increases, we're, we've got to do something to still get a picture. Right? Generally what we wind up having to do is turn up the dose, turn up the mass. Because like I just said, we can't increase the KVP any higher. We've got the KVP as high as we can go. Any higher than that, we've just got scattered land. Right? So we've got to increase the mass, the dose, the number of x-rays we're throwing at them, and we can start to get a picture. There will be a lot of scatter in that picture, so this is going to be one of the main, you can see there's always a little human error in the process. This is the human error piece, right? How are we still going to get to see what we need to see on this picture, right? Honestly, this slide has a lot of information buried in it. This slide kind of can inform you of almost every critical thinking step that you would have as a CT tech. So embedded in this slide is a lot. We'll be returning to this slide and this concept of differential absorption a lot, right? So for an example, from the clinical domain of situations that can arise where this slide is in the back of my mind. Um, I was briefly working at a facility um, in Texas and we, people would call us and ask us, what is your table weight limit for the CT scanner? And they would send us a patient close to table weight limit, like 400 pounds or more, right? And as we're imaging this person, we know I cannot increase the KVP, 
right? I can increase the mass, and I will be increasing both the noise and the signal. So what's my third option? Increase the Z number, right? How do I do that? I inject contrast, right? By injecting contrast in the patient, I've just introduced iodine into their system, which has a higher Z number. So now, hopefully, I'll be able to see what I need to see through all the noise, right? So these kinds of considerations are happening clinically all the time. So I've tried to make it as simple as possible so that it's as generalizable as possible for all these different clinical scenarios. All right, thank you all so much. I think this, this picture is interesting. It, it comes from a study, I don't remember who did it, um, but it's, uh, it was asking radiologists to look at this slide to detect, I think, like a, a nodule or something like that. But a large number of them missed the gorilla dancing right here in this lobe of the patient's lung. And so it, it shows just kind of how, if we're focused on one thing, it can exclude, we can get the blinders on and miss some other stuff. Um, so uh, I, one of the reasons I, I presented this material the way I did is I want to make sure that we kind of can think critically about this stuff, right? There's not as many definitions in this presentation, but I want to kind of keep those blinders off as long as possible. Um, if you're uncomfortable with that, I get it, right? But I will work as we progress into the trimester to try to narrow down and provide more definitions. One thing I want to challenge y'all with, though, 